This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about how people really lose their Bitcoin. We've been talking about the Bitcoin Dark Skippy attack. As far as I know, there's no evidence that Dark Skippy has ever been viewed in the wild. I'll put a link in the description notes for those of you who haven't seen this video and want to watch it. Fortunately, this just remains a theoretical attack vector as far as I can tell. But it's still a very good reminder why it's important to protect physical access to your hardware wallet, as well as take precautions when installing or upgrading the firmware as I speak about in that video. In reality, most people lose their Bitcoin in much less exciting ways. This was a comment from Funland108. A friend lost nearly a whole Bitcoin when he reinstalled his Ledger software. It asked him to enter his 24-word seed phrase into the computer, and boom, the balance disappeared. To this day, I don't know how it happened. Well, I can tell him how, to, how it happened right here. Basically, that was malware. That was not real software from Ledger. And the way you know is this software will never ask you to enter your 24-word seed online. It will only ask you to enter it into your hardware wallet itself. This is very important. Never, ever, ever, ever enter your 12 or 24 word recovery seed anywhere online. And if you find yourself doing so for some reason, you need to stop, you need to backtrack and think about what you're doing. Another way that people lose their Bitcoin, there was a ledger privacy leak where they got the names and home addresses of many people because ledger did not guard that material carefully enough. And then a couple of years ago, this was in 2021, scammers were sending Ledger users fake hardware wallets in the mail. And then as soon as they put their data on there, there was some way that the hackers were able to extract it. You can also have it on the software side of things, the coordination software side of things where Ledger Live, there's a fake Ledger Live app in Microsoft's app store. So you have to be very careful what you use and i would avoid ledger personally i prefer cold card and blockstream jade as as good hardware wallets another way that people lose their bitcoin and make mistakes in general is they go to the wrong url when they're typing in something this can be called typo squatting where it's a website that looks very familiar but there's a small mistake maybe there's an l instead of an i or something like that and then people think they're on the correct website the correct bitcoin website for some wallet and they enter some information there that they shouldn't Another way that people lose Bitcoin, to send Bitcoin from one, one address to another, many of you know this already, you need to sign a transaction with your private keys. This is what your hardware wallet does, and it does it in a safe manner when it's working correctly and keeps those private keys from ever touching the internet. But you need to sign a transaction to unlock Bitcoin from an address to send it to a different address, whether that different address is one that you control or one that someone else controls. So if you send your Bitcoin to a scammer or just any Bitcoin address that you don't control the private keys to, there's no one in the world, there's no customer support, there's no bailout, there's no one in the world who can return that Bitcoin to you, except of course the person who controls the private keys to that address that you just sent your Bitcoin to. And no one may control it, it may just be an address that you accidentally generated or you mistyped. Sometimes people lose their Bitcoin by mistyping a Bitcoin address and sending Bitcoin into it. So if you do this Bitcoin, your Bitcoin will be gone forever that you send to that address because there'll be no way to unlock it because you don't have the private key and in many cases no one else will as well. So be sure always to double and triple check Bitcoin addresses before sending. You can also send a small amount to test an address and make sure that you still control it and then send over the larger amount whether you're withdrawing from an exchange or moving from one an address on one Bitcoin hardware wallet to another Bitcoin hardware wallet. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Hit the subscribe button, leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Share this video with a friend or family member, and then there are monetary ways of helping as well. You can leave a tip, a super thanks, or a thanks. They're sometimes called different things, it seems, on the app. You can also join the channel, get some free emojis, and get an extra monthly video. Just click the join button or the link in the pinned comment. If you spend any time on Twitter or X, you'll see a number of Bitcoin scams being reported. It's Jameson Lop talking about a thing, a notice sent out by scammers pretending to be Gemini, where they basically, they give you a recovery phrase. They give you 12 words. They want you to enter that into your wallet and then use that to generate a Bitcoin address and send your Bitcoin supposedly to keep it safe from Gemini, send your Bitcoin there. The problem is the attacker also is watching this address. So as soon as you send something to it, they will move it to a different address that's not controlled by this recovery phrase. Something similar happening with a phishing email sent to some swan 
on marketing email clients from one of the old 2022 email hacks. This is what it looks like. We partnered with Trust Wallet. Again, this is a scam. Don't, don't do anything it says in here. We've partnered with Trust Wallet, a self-custody wallet to help secure your assets. And basically, they want you to send your Bitcoin to this address. And this will be one that you do not control. And your Bitcoin will be gone forever if you send it to someone else. Again, a reminder, never ever enter your 12 or 24 word recovery seat anywhere online. And also don't send your Bitcoin to some random address that hasn't been generated and confirmed on the screen of your hardware wallet. Also never enter your recovery seat or 12 or 24 words into a web form. Don't take a digital picture of it. Don't send it in an email or a text. These, these recovery seats, these 12 or 24 words should never touch the internet. And if they do, you have to assume that they've been spread everywhere by malware or by people. And so you need to start fresh with a fresh recovery seed. Don't take a picture of it. Don't send it an email or text. Don't upload it to Google Drive or Apple iCloud. Don't, your lap, don't let your laptop or desktop camera or, or phone camera see your recovery seed. So make sure it's covered up when you have your phone around or put your phone in a different room or a drawer when you're dealing with your recovery seed. And when you're working with your hardware wallet, you probably should have no other electronic devices in the room except maybe a laptop or desktop. Don't even whisper your 12 or 24 words out loud in the presence of any electronic device because you can assume they're all listening. Hopefully you've already smashed your Alexa or Siri or Google Nest smart home devices into a thousand pieces because you don't want Jeff Bezos and you don't want Tim Cook listening to everything that's happening in your house. The only place you should ever enter your recovery seed, your 12 or 24 words, is into a new hardware wallet that you trust, that you purchased from the original maker, not a used hardware wallet, and a wallet that you haven't left unintended in public anywhere where someone could swap it out in a so-called evil maid attack. It's also best practice just in general in terms of internet hygiene and online hygiene. Never click on links in emails or texts. It's much better to type in the correct URL yourself so you don't end up on the wrong site and bookmark it once you found the correct site so you can easily go back there because sometimes if you do a Google search, the top line will be a sponsored a sponsored ad that leads you to a fake URL that's actually run by scammers. More people have probably lost more Bitcoin though just by leaving it on an exchange or other custodial solution like Mt. Gox, Quadriga in Canada, Celsius, FTX, Voyager, BlockFi, etc. And while some people have gotten their Bitcoin back from these schemes and scams, many others have not. For example, Quadriga, people got about 13% of their money back. That's, that's all. In terms of Mt. Gox and BlockFi and some of these other things, it looks like people are getting more money back than uh, than some of the old exchange exchange hacks. Celsius customers have been having a problem though, even those who withdrew early. Celsius turns up the heat on customer clawbacks and what they're doing is they've started to issue demand emails to former customers of Celsius who made net withdrawals from Celsius greater than $100,000 in the 90 days prior to Celsius's bankruptcy filing date. So even if you're able to pull your funds out in time, they're trying to claw back your funds. And it's unclear to me whether they can legally do this, but they might be able to get away with it depending on how the bankruptcy law works. Other problems with leaving your Bitcoin on an exchange, some hacker might convince you by posing as the company itself to give them access to your Coinbase account or other account, and then they would drain it. They may be phishing for your password or even your 2FA information. Or someone DMs you or texts you and pretends to be from Trezor, Ledger, or Coinbase, or Swan, or River, or Strike, or any of these places, and they want to help you, quote unquote, help you with some made up problem, which requires that you share your seed with them. Again, you should never share your recovery seed with anyone online, and any, all legitimate companies will never ask for something like that. Other ways to lose your Bitcoin, people write down their 12 word recovery seeds or 24 word recovery seeds incorrectly or illegibly or they put it on a piece of paper that then accidentally gets thrown out by the, your toddler or by a house cleaner, or it burns up in a fire, it gets washed away in a flood, heaven forbid, if something happens to your house, or you leave your 12 words on a metal plate in a home safe, and then thieves steal the whole safe if it's not heavy enough or properly secured. I've heard about this happening to people. Or another way you lose your Bitcoin, you use a hardware wallet to generate your 12 word seed. Then you memorize that seed, you factory reset the hardware wallet so that it's no longer on the hardware wallet, your seed. This works until you get hit on the head really hard and forget your 12 word seed or heaven forbid, get in a bad car accident 
or a thief takes a $5 wrench, the so-called $5 wrench attack. They probably cost a little bit more now, thanks to inflation. So a thief takes a $10 wrench to your house and beats you until you reveal your memorized 12-word seed. One way around this, store a small amount of Bitcoin on your hardware wallet, then create an entirely new hidden wallet by adding a passphrase to your recovery seed, and then store the bulk of your Bitcoin in that hidden wallet. That's basically a wallet within a wallet on your hardware wallet. This is called a passphrase if you want to look it up, and I have some videos covering that as well. That way, in a wrench attack, you can at least give the attacker some Bitcoin from that surface level wallet, that non-passphrase wallet, and maybe they'll go away and be satisfied and not realize that you have passphrase protected Bitcoin as well on there. Many people have asked how I store my Bitcoin. I store it in a multi-vendor, multi-sig with geographically distributed hardware wallets. It's a bit of a pain, but I think it's the only real solution, unfortunately, for public Bitcoiners like myself. Second Amendment, as we've been speaking about, is also a nice feature for American Bitcoiners as we move away from a fiat standard to a combined Bitcoin standard and quote-unquote lead standard. You probably can understand what that joke means. Multi-vendor, multi-sig, multi-vendor part means different hardware wallet manufacturers. So maybe you use a foundation passport and a cold card and a Blockstream Jade, for example, would be three very good Bitcoin-only wallets you could use in a multi-vendor multi-sig setup the way multi-sig works is you need to sign two out of, you need two out of the three keys or three out of the five keys or four out of the seven you can really send it set it up however you want but you need a quorum of keys to sign in order to move the bitcoin in a bitcoin transaction you then store these keys these hardware wallets in different locations and so you're protected against single vendor attack and you're protected against many single points of failure Multisig protects you from a dark skippy attack as well too. Multisig plus the Second Amendment protects you from home robbery Bitcoin attacks. Multisig protects you from someone finding your 12 words and draining your money since they would also need a second key or a third key depending how you set up your multisig. They need another key to move the funds if you're using two out of three multi-sig, they would need another key. You can even take one of your multi-sig hardware wallets and also use it as a single SIG wallet at the same time, similar to what we were talking about, adding a passphrase to your single SIG wallet. In this case, you'd have a single SIG solution and a multi-sig solution. You'd have one wallet that was part of the multi-sig quorum and then was also just a single SIG wallet. And you could also leave a decoy amount of Bitcoin on that that you're willing to give up to a thief so that they think that's all you own on that hardware wallet. Now, the more people who use multi-sig, the better it really is for everyone. If thieves begin to learn that most people are using multi-sig, then they'll realize that it's no longer profitable to break into people's homes to steal their Bitcoin. Now, the easiest multi-sig solution for most people is some form of collaborative custody. My favorite is the vaults that are run by Unchained. It used to be called Unchained Capital. This is two out of three multi-sig. You have a total of three keys that control your multi-sig wallet. You hold two keys and Unchain holds a backup, a third key. So they can't move your Bitcoin without your permission. But if you lose one of your keys, they can help you out. And they can also help you up, help you out with the setup, which can be a little bit tricky. It's very important to back up your three X pubs, back up your derivation path as well. And so there's also a do-it-yourself solution. You can do this with Sparrow Wallet. And that's something if you need a little bit more hand-holding, I do cover in my paid course as well. The ultimate Bitcoin storage solution, do-it-yourself multi-vendor, multi-sig. This is really the most self-sovereign way of doing it. If you want a an easier solution though, and one that's less easy to mess up, definitely Unchained is a good solution. I think they have an annual fee for this now, uh, but still a good solution in terms of teaching you how to get it set up. So this is the, the slightly less private, but easier solution, and then the more private, more self-sovereign solutions. You have to really decide what works best for you for the particular stage that you're at. And you don't want to use a techno technical solution that exceeds your technical capabilities. This is another way that people end up losing their Bitcoin. But if you're ready for a more self-sovereign solution, I'll put a link to my paid course in the description notes below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.